So welcome back, everybody, for another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. We're very happy to have uh, Hun Song Shin with us from the Bank for International Settlements. Hi, Hun. Good to see you. Hi, Marcus. It's great to join you and the, and the rest of the audience. Thanks for everybody for coming. And uh, we're looking forward to Hyun's take on the crypto crash and the role of the CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currencies. So let me give a few opening remarks. As most observers have observed that actually crypto assets expanded a lot and now they're collapsing and we're going potentially in a crypto winter. So what you see, you see a huge for Bitcoin, I've plotted here Bitcoin and Ether. You see a huge expansion in value of Bitcoin almost to 70,000 and then coming down significantly to 19,000 uh, at the moment, roughly. And Ether is actually, was almost 4,000 is coming back uh, below uh, 1,000, around 1,000. What's interesting is if you look at March 2020, you also see a decline when actually COVID was breaking out, there was a decline in the crypto assets. And subsequently, there was this huge run up. Of course, the run up is characterized, this period is also characterized when the Fed was cutting the interest rates or central banks were cutting the interest rates dramatically. Now we're in a phase where central banks are increasing interest rates and you see the crypto assets are going down. Of course, there are stable coins as well. So they're not so stable as we thought. And mostly they are algorithmic ones. So they're not backed by actually, they're backed by an algorithm when the price goes down. When people withdraw funds from stable coins, they have some mechanism, some algorithm to liquidate some assets to back it up. And some of the stable coins actually couldn't uh, keep their pack, could be their stable, so Terra USD uh, is one of them, and we will learn about that uh, probably more. Now, what are the underlying frictions? Why do we see such a huge crypto crash? I think one explanation is a traditional finance explanation that, you know, some of the holders of these crypto assets, they're just levered, and there's a margin spiral kicking in, so you have the price going down, with the price, the volatility is going up and the value at risk measures are going up. And then the margin calls are coming in. So the margins are coming, are going up and margin calls people have to because they make losses on the leverage positions. And they have to reduce the leverage position that pushes the price down further and you have to leverage this uh, margin spiral kicking in and the spiral essentially makes things worse and worse. That's one uh, perspective. It's very much traditional finance. And of course, another perspective is that you have a huge bubble and the bubble is bursting. That's also related to financial frictions. So what often people say that Bitcoin is a new digital form of gold and actually Bitcoin tries to associate itself, itself with gold. And gold typically appreciates in times of crisis. While what we have seen is actually uh, crypto is not necessarily a safe asset. So the question is, if we move from a risk on the risk off phase, will crypto appreciate or depreciate? And a safe asset typically appreciates in times of crisis when we go to a risk off phase. So nobody wants to hold some risky assets anymore and everybody is rushing flight to safety into a safe asset. The question is, how can we price these crypto assets? How can we derive some fundamental value and have some thoughts about that? And essentially, some people say crypto assets like Bitcoin are like gold, they're a safe asset. Others say they're like tech stocks. And the question is, can there be both uh, a safe asset or a tech stock? A safe asset is characterized that actually appreciates in times of high volatility, in times of when everybody wants to get rid of risky assets. So one way to think about the valuation of safe assets is just the present value of cash flows plus some service flows. So typically assets have a service flow on top of the cash flows. And where does the service flow come from? It could be convenience yield, which is very small, but typically a larger fraction, that's in particular for government bonds, is coming from retrading. So if you have a setting with incubated markets, uh, you can retrade the safe asset. And by retrading the safe asset, you actually can partially insure each other against uninsurably disincratic risk. So that's where this additional service flow comes from. And in times of crisis, idiosyncratic risk, uninsurable idiosyncratic risk is more pronounced because everything is more risky in times of crisis. Hence, the value of being able to insure yourself against it, the service flow is appreciating in times of crisis. 
So essentially what you have, you get a negative beta asset, which appreciates at times of crisis because you really value the service flow in bad times much more than in good times. In good times, there's not so much idiosyncratic risk. Now, you can only do this with assets which are easily tradable. So you need a high market liquidity for that. So typically safe assets are assets with a, a low informational sensitivity. That's what Gary Gordon, Bank Tomstrom, and others have pointed out. Safe assets have the feature that they don't have much asymmetric information attached to it. So they're informationally insensitive. Hence the bid ask spreads are low. You can easily trade them and have high market liquidity. So that's essentially, if you think of uh, the crypto assets, the safe asset, uh, that's what would happen is that times of crisis uh, and or in times of risk off phase, uh, you would expect that actually the price goes up. We didn't see that. The alternative perspective is that actually crypto assets are more like tech stocks or have a growth option attached to it. And actually the benefit you get, the cash flows from tech stocks is far into the future. Hence, when there's a risk off phase, uh, then actually you get actually tech stocks tank. And we see that already that technology stocks and growth stocks are tanking relative to value stocks and so forth. That also means because you have this risk and the risk is far in the future, you have actually a positive beta. So the cap M beta is positive. And I think one way to reconcile that is like your crypto assets could be a safe asset, but not yet. They have the option to become a safe asset in 10 years. So like a tech stock, the service flow is far into the future. And that's, you know, you have to figure out. And that's why it's not at the moment, it has a negative beta. It has still a positive beta because the service flow are far in the future, like the cash flows are far in the future for the tech stocks. So that's essentially one way uh, to view that. Another view, coming back to more to the bubble perspective, if you look at a lot of the safe assets, in particular, all the crypto assets that don't give you any cash flow, there's no interest rate payment from this crypto assets. Bitcoin doesn't give you and in holding Bitcoin, you don't get any interest payment. You only get capital appreciation. So you only, when you do the discounting, you only get essentially the service flow. But if you have an asset which pays you no cash flows and only service flow, that's essentially a bubble. It only allows you to partially reinsure yourself with others by retrading it. Uh, but there's also always an equilibrium where there's no bubble attached to it. So you have one equilibrium where there is a positive value, a bubble value on the safe asset, and because there's a positive value, you can do this retrading and you can partially insure yourself. And that gives you the positive value. That's a good equilibrium or the bubbly equilibrium. Then there's another equilibrium uh, where there's the service flow is the, the value of the asset is zero. Hence, it also doesn't give you a service flow. So there's always at least two equilibria which can uh, arise there. The bubble equilibrium can only arise when R is smaller than G. So that's uh, for, can be, well, then the question is, where is the bubble on? It can be on a crypto asset or it can be on the US treasury. Okay, and that's essentially some work I did with uh, Yuli and uh, Sebastian Merkel is an FTPL with the bubble where we show which asset is the bubble on. And of course, the government has some power and we argue they can attract the bubble onto its government debt. And that's essentially what they will do, but there will be a competition to have the exorbitant privilege and to be able to issue the safe asset or mine the bubble essentially. And there will be a lot of measures in order to ensure that the bubble is actually on the government debt rather than on private uh, assets. And you see this in particular, when the Fed is hiking the nominal interest rate, then actually you get even a cash flow payment on the US treasury, but then it's not possible for these other bubbly assets to persist next to it. And that essentially then triggers that the bubble, if it still remains, it can jump from the crypto to the US treasuries uh, uh, going forward. So with this thought, I would like to say, we talked a lot about crypto, how does this affect the CBDC? And the CBDC is the central bank digital currency, which is essentially a digital currency coming from the official sector. Digital currency is always attached to a digital ledger. That's the element like cash is not attached to a ledger. As a digital currency is always attached to a ledger. But CBDC can be seen as a guarantor of uniformity of money. You always have the danger of fragmentation of money. And historically, if you go back, every bank was giving out a bit different bank notes. And, you know, they were not equivalent to each other, but if you want the uniform money or, you know, in the whole EU area or in the US, then you have some 
cash as an anchor, or you have in the digital world CBDC as the anchor to, prefer, to preserve the uniformity of the money. And also with it, then the unit of account and the, controlling the unit of account gives then the central bank monetary sovereignty to stimulate or slow down the economy. So that's was, you know, the main, the CBDC as a guarantor of the uniformity of money was the main uh, message on this uh, digital euro project or report I wrote for the European Parliament with Shopia Lando. So you can also have stable coins. They're also attached to the unit of account to the US dollar, the euro, or the yen, and so forth. But then you have to make sure that the stable coins are really stable. You need regulation. And you could argue that you know, stable coins should have a backing, and as a backing, they should hold some CBDC. The question is how much? 100% uh, could be one banking. And this would be like a narrow banking an analogy. So the stable coin providers would be like narrow banks. And this way, the synergy from giving out the stable coins would actually go to the government because the government then, you know, issues the CBDC instead. Finally, the fragmentation also comes if you make money programmable. So let me say you have a particular uh, money which expires. It's a very simple way to program it, saying by the end of the month, the money is expiring. That's not the same coin as a coin which does not expire. And if you can make many, many different programs on money, you have a segmentation or a fragmentation of the money. And that's also dangerous if you have too much programmability because you get not the uniformity of money is lost. But you can achieve the same thing with programmable wallets. You don't have to make the money programmable, but you can also make the wallets programmable. So for example, if go bank, if a money expires at the end of the month, you could also be, I give you some coin, which is not expiring, but we make another smart contract so that at the end of the month, you have to pay me back a coin. This way we achieve the same thing, but we still preserve the uniformity of money and we don't fragment uh, the money supply. And finally, what's important is that we will have a lot of ledgers. Many supply chains will be handled on ledgers. And we need a so what we call Jonathan Payne, and I call a smart CBDC, where this ledger of the underlying of the C, the underlying ledger of the CBDC is connected to all the other ledgers in industry 4.0. So the back rail of these ledgers uh, for many of the stable coins, tokens from various supply chains should be linked to the CBDC. A ledger. So the interoperability across the ledgers is very important. But of course, if it's too interoperable and everybody can uh, see everything, the privacy issue becomes more of an issue. So that's a big challenge on, on this space. So with this uh, short brief remarks, let me go to the poll questions, which we ask you. And uh, Hyun proposed the following three questions. What are the biggest risks for the crypto sectors? Is it a run on the stable coins and crypto banks? Is it the price decline and the leveraging? So run, actually people 32% thought run is the biggest risk. And a price decline and deleveraging, margin calls and so forth is 9% or both. That's what the majority thought, 58%. So 32%, 9%, 58%. And there's no risk at all in the crypto market. That's what only 1% thought. So there is risk, of course. Um, the second question was, which crypto coin will survive the crypto winter? Is it most of the of the 10,000 coins in the coin market cap? Uh, that's what 11% uh, thought. Only Bitcoin and Ether, that's 32%. Only Bitcoin because Bitcoin is not a crypto coin. So there's some controversy in the uh, DeFi community. It's 14%. Or it's between two and 10,000 uh, coins. That's 43%. So it's 11%, 32%, 14%, and 43%. The majority is, uh, it's a little bit bimodal. So it's, uh, it's not clear um, what, uh, there's no big agreement on that. And finally, will the crypto winter actually slow down the CBDC dynamics driven by the central banks? Yes or no? And 59%, almost 60% said yes, it will slow down the dynamics, how active central banks will pursue the digital euro or the digital dollar or digital yuan and so forth. Uh, that's almost 60% and 41% thought it will not slow it down. So with these remarks, I pass on the mic to Hyun and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Marcus. Um, and uh, thank you again for the kind invitation. Um, um, 
And that was a very good introduction, Marcus. I think you, you really set the stage very well for us. And uh, I was very interested to, to see the, um, uh, the answers to those, uh, to those poll questions. Uh, well, uh, you know, as we, uh, as we speak, uh, you know, the ecosystem uh, of, uh, of crypto coins and, uh, and shadow crypto banks uh, you know, under, or under, you know, some strain. Um, and as you laid out, Marcus, it is remarkable how similar some of the mechanisms uh, that we see being play, uh, th that are playing out in the crypto universe uh, are to the very familiar channels that we, that we both studied um, during the GFC, uh, you know, during the, um, during a subprime crisis. Um, of course, the big difference is that, uh, you know, as yet, there's no central bank in the crypto world. And so there's no, if you like, a natural fire break to some of the deleveraging that we're seeing. Um, but let me come back to that uh, later. Now, of course, the, the price action and some of the stress we're seeing in the, in the crypto sector, uh, you know, it's these things that are grabbing all the headlines. But uh, what I thought would be um, an important um, you know, strand uh, that we should address uh, are some of the longer term questions. Um, and what I want to do is to draw a few strands from uh, the BIS annual economic report, um, which we published uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we actually have a, have a pretty substantial discussion of, uh, of CBDCs there. But, um, Embarking on that discussion very much with uh, the, the, the crypto universe um, at the back of our minds. So when we actually started writing this chapter, uh, the crypto sector wasn't in the current turmoil that it is now. Um, so what, what we were focused on were some of the longer term issues. Uh, what are some of the longer term structural issues that we see uh, in the crypto sector? And uh, uh, what uh, do these longer term structural features tell us about the, uh, the suitability of crypto uh, as being the basis of a monetary system? Um, so that's what I'd like to do um, in, this, in this presentation. Uh, now, so, so what are some of these uh, longer term structural issues? Well, I think one thing that uh, you know, we can certainly point to is the... Um, is the role played by stable coins uh, in, in the crypto universe. Uh, so in this context, uh, we should think of stable coins as um, cryptocurrencies that aim to maintain a stable value relative to traditional currencies, uh, most notably the US dollar. And uh, the prevalence of stable coins uh, in the crypto universe, I think indicates um, the pervasive need of crypto to, if you like, piggyback on the credibility of central bank money. Yeah, it's a search for a nominal anchor um, that, um, uh, that will give some kind of stability to the role of, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the exchange between, between stable coins and between, you know, between crypto coins and between crypto coins and, uh, and uh, fiat money. But I think one thing we've learned especially since May, is that uh, stable coins are far from stable. Um, of course, the big news in May was the collapse of Terra stablecoin, uh, which, you know, which was a big deal because uh, it had been the third largest. And over a few days in May, it actually collapsed uh, together with its sister coin, Luna. Uh, maybe if there's time, we can, we can come back to uh, some of the interesting um, the features of that uh, uh, so-called uh, death spiral that we saw, um, but the but for this presentation, what I want, what I like to just uh, put on the table here is that, you know, um, crypto started by um, turning its back um, on uh, central bank money, um, but um, but in a way. Um, it has quickly rediscovered the need for a stable unit of account. Uh, and it's best provided by uh, central bank money. It's the real money issued by the central bank itself. So, so can I ask you, 
A quick yeah. question about so more than 90%, way more than 90% of the stable coins are denominated in US dollars. Yeah. Do you have an explanation why that is? And of course, is do you predict that actually the dollar will become even more prominent down the road if we move more in the stablecoin arrangement? That's a very good yeah, question. To the euro me, or other. Both question, because that, that's going to take us um, down a different route. But uh, please remind me and um, uh, uh, you know, ask this question again, because it is a very, very important part of the story. Um, so I'm not, uh, so let's come back to this. But what I wanted to say was, you know, the, um, so the punchline here is the prevalence of stable coins shows that if central bank money did not exist, it would need to be invented. Um, so that's, if you like, the role of uh, stable coins as a unit of account. Now, I think this is a clue as to what an alternative system might look like. Let's go to the, the role of money as a, uh, as a means of exchange. Now, um, you know, money, as we know, is a social convention. Um, it's a convention in the sense that uh, you know, we have an equilibrium. Uh, we accept money in transactions because we expect others to accept money uh, you know, when we want to use it in the future. And so, um, you know, in that sense, money is the perfect example of uh, network effects that we, that we expect. Um, and I think this actually points to a very, very interesting departure of crypto itself. Um, because with money and the network effects, we expect this virtuous circle of greater use and greater acceptance, right? So the more we use it, the more it's accepted, the more it's accepted, the more we use it. And so we have this virtuous circle this is typically why uh, you know, one version of money just emerges and uh, everyone coalesces around that one version. If you think about crypto, um, it doesn't work like that. So you know, one of the things that really strikes uh, the observer, and Mark, as you mentioned CoinMarketCap, if you go to that site, there are you know, 10,000 crypto coins that are listed there. And those are the ones that we know about. And you know, there'll be others that are not actually listed. 10,000, right? Uh, so why is there is such a proliferation of crypto coins? So this is, uh, if you like, an example of the extreme fragmentation of the crypto universe that, uh, that Marcus referred to earlier. As I said, if crypto was suitable as money, we would have seen one crypto coin around which everyone coalesced. Um, now, of course, uh, Bitcoin and Ether uh, are the two most prominent ones, but we haven't actually seen um, everyone coalescing around one. Instead, we see this uh, severe form of fragmentation. You know, they're all. Can you play a devil's advocate a little bit? I agree with you, but uh, just yeah. for the sake of argument. Of course, one could argue that the switching cost from one currency to another currency these days is so much easier. Yeah. So I can switch on, on my iPhone or on my smartphone within a second from one currency to another currency. In the olden days, I couldn't do that. So the network effects are not so pronounced anymore because of this much lower switching costs. Yeah, I'm not so sure that that's correct, Marcus. Um, certainly lower switching costs uh, are part of the story. But if you go back to the DeFi universe, you know, there are, you know, so, so think about how the blockchain works. Um, you know, we have a blockchain that, if you like, whatever is on the blockchain is an arbiter of the truth. So whatever the blockchain says is true, is true. And so it, it's, it's like a kind of, you know, a chronicle of, uh, of, of the real world uh, as laid out in the blockchain. It's like saying, so if, if there's more than one layer one blockchain, it's like saying there's more than one version of history. Of course, you know, you can have bridges across the layer one blockchains. Um, and, you know, that's uh, what allows uh, one coin to be transferred and you can actually have these, um, uh, you know, very rich, uh, you know, ecosystem of, uh, of assets, if you like. But, it's not really the same thing as uh, you know there being one coin around which everyone co uh, around which everyone coalesces, um, and I think it is actually worth thinking about. Uh, and, I, and and let me show you another thing shortly, which I think will will reinforce this message. Um, uh, but I think the you know the clue here, uh, and this is getting at the game theory, which I think is a pretty important part of this is that crypto runs under the banner of decentralization, where you know, settlement is done through consensus formed by validators. And these validators can be you know, miners, as in Bitcoin, 
or large holders of coins uh, in a in a proof of stake uh, in a crypto system. And you can think of uh, the fragmentation um, as arising from the need to channel rents to the validators and other insiders. Yeah. So let me just uh, um, let me just um, oops. Okay. Okay. That I think that so you can see that now. The um, what this chart shows is uh, the gas fees on Ethereum, with uh, the horizontal axis showing the number of transactions per day, and the vertical axis um, uh, is the transactions cost for for users on the Ethereum blockchain. And you see this, um, you know, very striking relationship where once you have congestion, uh, you know, user fees are actually uh, you know quite high. Now, what that uh, you know suggests is that, uh, and in a way, the high user fees. Um, can be thought of as a, as a feature, not a bug, right? It's the high user fees that are collected by the insiders, and it's the high user fees that actually sustain the rents uh, that actually go to the validators. And uh, you know, we, we see it also you know, quite strikingly in, in Bitcoin. Um, but I think the, the point here is that if you look at the game theory, if you look at the payoffs of the game here, um, we have congestion, which is very unlike money. Uh, if you think about it, you know, it, with money, we have this virtue circle of greater acceptance and greater use. Whereas crypto generates high cost, and it's the rents to the insiders, and it's the congestion, which, which actually turns out to be a really an integral part of the of the way that uh, of this universe works. Now, of course, what this does is to open up a gap to new entrants with higher capacity. Um, and let me just, um, um, oops. Can I just, uh, let me, my slides have just frozen here. Let me stop sharing and then share again. Okay, now what I, want, what I wanted to do was to, actually I wanted to go to the next slide. <laughs> Here we are. So, um, so what, what I want to do is to illustrate this point of congestion um, uh, by looking at the, the proliferation of different blockchains, um, especially in the, in the DeFi universe. Let me come back to this diagram in a second. Let's go to the DeFi universe and ask the question, which blockchain um, is the one where uh, the highest value collateral is locked? Now, if you go back to as recently as the end of 2020, uh, of course, the Ethereum blockchain was the dominant um, uh, layer one, as it were. It's the, you know, it's the, it's the most, um, uh, I mean, this, is, this was the one that uh, came first. Uh, it actually established uh, a commanding position uh, in the DeFi universe. But as it became more and more popular, the proportion of value locked in Ethereum began to fall. And what happened it, uh, you know, over time was that the high gas fees opened up. Um, it actually opened the gap for these other uh, alternative layer ones, so-called. So here in yellow, you see Binance, you see Terra here in red, uh, beginning to make, um, make its entry. There are these other ones like Solana, Tron, Avalanche that are just uh, you know, not uh, so easily visible. We actually get to early May this year and Ethereum's market share just goes down to like 50%. So remember Marcus, we started off with Ethereum close to 100% market share. Mm -hmm. And if you had network effects, that's like saying, well, you know, uh, if you have something which is already dominant, surely the network effects and strategic complementarities would reinforce that advantage. And essentially Ethereum would crowd out everything. Instead, what we're seeing, what we saw coming into 2021 was that uh, congestion kicked in. You ha we had strategic substitutes rather than strategic complements. And that actually opened up a gap and these newer uh, blockchains, you know, um, exploited that gap, entered. And look at Terra. Look at Terra in red. Mm -hmm. um, and in the case of these newer blockchains, 
uh, and there's Solana, which uh, is, is also much talked about, very active in the NFT space. These new blockchains, um, you know, they had higher capacity and they could exploit that higher capacity and, you know, they could cut corners on decentralization, right? I mean, you know, a lot of these newer, uh, you know, newer layer ones, they, you know, they, they were less decentralized, uh, arguably, than Ethereum itself. But that was fine because, you know, what the, the way that they saw it, they could grab market share. So this was as of early May. And so we know what happened. To what we extent what was it the fact that uh, Ethereum was playing, moving from a proof of work to a proof of stake arrangement and they're still struggling to come uh, to a particular framework there? The other question well, I have well, is... Yeah, Is, did you look at high frequency? Is it like certain points, certain days, there's a lot of congestions and then you see the movement? Um, did you yeah. even win minute by minute? Or when is it really Ethereum suffering? Is it whenever the congestion is very high on this particular, in this particular hour and then they lose their market share then? That's very good, yeah. Um, and uh, in fact, the answer to that is yes. We, uh, you know, we can look at the, we can look at the blockchain. Of course, you know, everything is transparent. Uh, you know, that's one of the, That's one of the advantages of um, you know of uh, of these systems that you know everything is visible to to everyone. I don't have a slide on that with me for this presentation, but I would just refer the um, uh, the participants to a recent BIS bulletin mm -hmm. that actually looked at the um, the higher frequency uh, you know evidence of this, and there is pretty good evidence that it's when these gas fees spike that we see uh, you know this shift towards. Um, towards this, uh, you know, the, these alternative blockchains. And just to finish my sentence, uh, you know, there's Terra in red. Uh, it was extremely popular. It grabbed huge market share. And over a few days in May, of course, it, uh, it just uh, imploded. Uh, and, you know, uh, of course, uh, now Ethereum share is, is higher. Well, actually everyone's share is higher because, uh, you know, Terra is not there anymore. But I think what this shows you is that uh, if we think of money, playing a coordination role. And as a convention, we expect there to be this virtuous circle. The more it's used, uh, the more it's accepted. And I think we, we recognize this, uh, you know, this virtuous circle um, uh, you know, as money. Of course, it can, it can also go in the other direction. It can, it can go in a, less, you know, in, in a less desirable way in the case of uh, platform competition and these tipping phenomena, if you have a big tech, so if a big tech comes and establishes a dominant position, it's very difficult for anyone else to break in. So we should have that welfare discussion. Um, and you know, that's clearly where the CBDC discussion will actually uh, you know, be very important. But let me just go back to the previous um, slide that I didn't have a chance to just explain. Finding the right capacity in a blockchain is, um, is a very difficult thing, actually. Um, you might think, well, why don't you just uh, choose a huge capacity to begin with so that you can actually anticipate uh, these, uh, you know, these congestion effects. But actually, that's not the answer either. Uh, if you recall the blockchain, the, the Bitcoin blockchain wars, the blockchain, sorry, the Bitcoin block size wars, uh, you know, a few years back, remember, There was a proposal to increase the block size of Bitcoin, um, but that didn't really take off. Uh, it's still the classical, you know, um, uh, uh, Bitcoin that we're on. That didn't really take off. And, uh, you know, uh, the picture on the right hand side there uh, is a tweet from one of the defenders of the status quo who's saying, look, this idea of increasing the Bitcoin block size, uh, I mean, it's like uh, that picture on the right hand side. If there's no congestion, you're not going to, uh, you know, channel any rewards to the miners. I mean, there's, there's of course the um, the, uh, the the block rewards that uh, you know that go to the miners. But you know, in steady state, once those all dissipate, it has to be the user fees that has to uh, you know sustain Bitcoin. And once there is excess capacity, no one's willing to you know pay uh, if. Um, there is no congestion. So actually, you know, um, it's, this is very, very different from what we would expect uh, money to be. Money, we think, has this virtuous circle. Once you have a dominant position, you're going to be, you know, that's going to be entrenched. Uh, crypto is very, very different. 
And it does actually um, give rise to, a, to an interesting question, which is, um, does crypto really only work if there are inflows of new users, yeah? And when the price is going up. Um, and, you know, we don't know for sure, but I think it's a reasonable hypothesis to say that, you know, crypto really only works when there are inflows of new users. Just to give you a kind of, you know, flavor of what that kind of uh, analysis might look like. So here's uh, the picture for Ethereum. The black line is the, is the annual change in the price of Ether. Um, and the pink bars are the new unique DeFi addresses. And clearly, you know, as uh, crypto prices have, uh, have been crashing, new users, uh, you know, have been, uh, you know, have been staying away. Now, what I want to do though is not, I mean, this is not just to, you know, bash crypto while it's down. I think what, what I really want to do for the, for the main part of this talk is just to look back and just realize that, you know, the rise of crypto over the last several years has been in a way a remarkable spectacle because it, it highlights the place of technology in the popular imagination and it's galvanizing role in debates on the shape of things to come. So what I want to do actually is to just, uh, um, if you like, channel some of that energy and, uh, you know, offer a more tantalizing, so, you know, um, so if you like, you know, crypto offers this tantalizing glimpse of new arrangements and uh, new technical features. But I want to make the case that um, CBDCs could actually do many of the same things, um, but without some of the costs. So uh, it would be, um, you know, resting on the right type of strategic interactions. It will actually have the feature of money. Uh, I mean, if you like, one kind of motto here would be anything that crypto can do uh, could be done better with uh, central bank money. Uh, of course, you know, apart from money laundering and, um, and ransomware attacks and, and those kinds of things, uh, and the, the sort of cyberpunk, um, uh, you know, agenda. Uh, so if you, if you put those to one side, uh, in terms of the, of the technical capacity, I wanna argue that anything that crypto can do, CBDCs can do as well. So, so can, can I just make sure that yeah, I fully understand? So you're saying on the one hand, there are no economies of scale on crypto because of congestions. On the other hand, you need a constant inflow of new in order to keep the value high. And that's where you see the tension between the two. Is this fair to say? And there's a question that by Dana, she would like to know, is crypto then ultimately a pyramid scheme? Because it only works if more people come in, but you say technologically can't even handle a, a larger inflow of I think that's an interesting, I mean, I, I, you know, we, um, I think we have a, you know, a couple of features that I think are undeniably there. Um, in terms of just the technology, if we abstract away from the crypto coin price itself, there is a definite sense that the capacity constraints play a very important role. It's a feature, not a bug, right? Because you want to decentralize, you need to make it self-sustaining. And that means that we have to find an equilibrium and give the right uh, centers. Uh, we, and that has to be self-sustaining. What that means is uh, the validators, whether they be miners in Bitcoin or the uh, proof of stake, um, uh, you know, sort of stakers in a proof of stake system, they need to be given rents, you know, from that system in order to sustain, uh, you know, the whole system. However, and this is where the, uh, the crypto coin uh, really comes in. We know for a fact, and uh, you also refer to this, Marcus, crypto prices tend to be positively correlated, yeah? both with each other and with risky asset prices. So what is undoubtedly true is that there are strategic complementarities in terms of the investor actions. Yeah? So the more I get into crypto, that's going to raise uh, the value. Of, that's going to raise the price of my coin, which has um, you know a positive spiller effect uh, into your coin, which will then you know um, um, elicit new flows, and therefore there is certainly a strategic complementarity in the crypto investment activities uh, themselves, so the inflows of new users, and that from time to time I would say can mask. 
the inherent strategic substitutes, mm -hmm. the substitutability um, in the underlying technology. So uh, what I would say is, yes, there are these fundamental structural issues there with, to do with congestion. But when you have a speculative episode, that can override the strategic complementarities can override the underlying structural, um, you know, the, um, the structural flaws, if you like. And so once you have a, you know, once you're in a, in a, in a period of strong investment in, uh, inflows, uh, you know, very rapidly rising crypto coin prices, you can have, uh, you know, this virtuous circle, or at least the outward appearance of a virtual circle, mm -hmm. but that's really driven by the speculative, uh, you know, cycle rather than the nature of money, you know, as a kind of coordination device. But I think that, uh, you know, difference is probably, you know, uh, something that's, um, you know, quite uh, important to bear in mind. But just to come back to the CBDCs, why do I say that, that everything you can do technically with crypto, you can also do with CBDCs? Well, first of all, um, everything rests on the secure foundations of central bank money. You don't need to invent, reinvent central bank money by uh, relying on stable coins. You know, you have the real thing there. If you have the real thing, why do you need stable coins? That's the first point. The second point is that um, uh, we know that uh, most of the customer serving activities are done by private sector players, commercial banks and other non-bank um, payment service providers. Those can be, um, uh, you know, we know for, from experience from several hundred years that those can be very well, um, um, uh, you know, very well acquitted by these commercial banks and other PSPs um, on the basis of central bank money. But on, on top of that, and I think this is where, you know, this year's chapter, uh, I think really sort of does paint this uh, bigger picture. What we're trying to say in this chapter is that it's not just that two-tier system. We should think of the whole ecosystem that builds on top. And I think this is what I want to just uh, you know, go through very, very briefly. Um, because... Um, can I you know, can ask for a con give go, you a yeah. concrete example and perhaps you can help me out on this? So that goes back to Jonathan Payne's presentation on the smart CBDC. Yeah. Well, let's suppose I have a supply chain and, you know, it's an automotive supply chain and uh, we keep track of all the engines and all the little pieces of the cars moving around with uh, sensors on it and there's a token on it. And the payment is, there's a payment rail on the supply chain. Yeah. And I can organize this payment token on the supply chain as a stable coin to the dollar, let's say, or to the euro, but it's on the ledger of this supply chain or this B2B platform. And, and then I can still connect it to the CBDC, but is, do you envision a CBDC arrangement where we, we can actually use and connect to the CBDC ledger of the central bank? So this any industry 4.0 um, platform would be then connecting to the central bank CBDC, or do you envision this will be a stable coin and there's a ledger of the supply chain, but they're just keeping track, uh, just yeah. making sure that it stays a stable, stable coin. You've just anticipated my next slide, Marcus. Okay. Um, so let me come to this because I think this is really at the heart of the issue. Um, and it's actually worth thinking back into history here. Uh, think of the Bank of Amsterdam. If you read, uh, if you read Adam Smith, as, uh, as some of us did um, you know, in our youth, uh, you know, he has a long discussion of the Bank of Amsterdam set up in 1605. Their whole purpose was to settle bills of exchange uh, in the supply chain, you know, in cross-border trade. And it's a time-honored tradition of um, debiting the account of the payer and crediting the account of the receiver. So the Bank of Amsterdam, uh, I mean, that was that, their whole purpose when, the, you know, when it was set up. It actually had um, gold and silver coins to back up these deposits. In that sense, it was like a stable coin. Mm -hmm. And uh, the settlement, you know, the ultimate settlement on the central bank balance sheet. And in, in a way, this harks back to a very interesting debate actually between uh, a school of thought that says the origin of central banks um, lies in the financing of wars. You know, this is Charles Goodhart's um, hypothesis from the Bank of England, you know, and it goes to the fiscal monetary nexus and so on. There's another school of thought, and Ulrich Binzel at the ECB 
uh, is arguing this, that you know, there's actually a long history of central banking even before the Bank of England. You can go back to the Bank of Amsterdam or even you know, further back where we should think about it's the money side of the banks, uh, is, of, the banks uh, of the central bank's balance sheet, which is key. It's the issuance of money as deposits, uh, which is key. And just to you know, address your question, um, I want to come to uh, CBDCs and in particular how wholesale CBDCs might actually uh, you know, do this. Um, you know, how can you think about decentralization using central bank money? Okay, so um, think about this example. So you know, there's, a, there's a flow of payments from A to B to C to D. And imagine that uh, these people lie on a supply chain. Um, now, the recipient, so you know, think about this by analogy with a physical bank note. So you know, if you want to hand over a $20 note, you would sort of you know, just uh, hand the physical bank note over. But, you know, um, and, uh, but uh, digitally, how would you do that? So the recipient of a physical bank note so here it's person D at the end of this chain, wants to be assured that uh, the note that she's getting is genuine and not a counterfeit uh, note, right? And how, and how would you do this uh, in a DLT platform using, using central bank money? Well, what you would need to do is to prove the origin or the source, if you like, of the money and to prove that the, that the, that the token was obtained from past valid transactions. So the, so the term here is provenance. You're, you want to prove the provenance of the token that you're transferring. Now, in the case of crypto, we know how crypto does that. In the case of crypto, crypto proves provenance by publicly posting everything. Yeah? It, prove, it posts the full history of all transactions by everyone. And then you can track yeah, through, through, the private, uh, through, the, um, uh, you know, through the private keys how uh, this token was arrived at. Now, of course, there's a crucial difference in the case of CBDCs because you're using real names, right? And uh, we're not gonna be using private keys. And when we use real names, we don't have the option of just proving, just posting everything on a big blockchain because no one else needs to know where I buy my groceries, right? And, and no one should be you know, privy to that information, yeah? Of course, there are you know, many more important transactions other than that, but you know, just as a principle, when real names are used, such public posting would clearly violate privacy. Now, this is where the, um, the cryptographic techniques really come into their own because you can use zero knowledge proofs to actually prove that, uh, you know, to actually prove the provenance of your token without necessarily um, listing all the transactions, yeah? Mm -hmm. and by doing that, what you're doing is you're simultaneously um, uh, ensuring the privacy of individuals, as well as proving provenance and therefore having decentralization, as well as having real names. And from the very beginning, uh, you know, you can leave aside um, money laundering, ransomware attacks and all of that stuff. Um, if you want that, you know, there's crypto, you can, you know, that's the, for the main payment system, you can do everything that you can do with crypto, but by using central bank money, it also means that uh, you don't have to use, um, uh, it also means that you, you, know, you can sidestep uh, all the problems to do with congestion. You can really let the, the full um, benefits of these network effects, you know, give them full flow. So what are these new capabilities? Let me just... Um, but can I just to make sure, is it a decentralized ledger where everybody can write on it, like a proof of work well, stack, a uh, proof of stake, or is it more centralized, a permission blockchain? What do you envision so, for the CBDC? It, I mean, I cannot well, imagine that this central bank will allow everybody to write on the central bank's blockchain. No? So it will need to have um, a prearranged set of players. Okay. Uh, so a very simple setup would be um, that you would have uh, two groups of nodes. So one group would be the central banks. And so they would uh, have the, the read privileges as well as the write privileges. And then there are the, um, then there are the other members of the network uh, and they could be commercial banks. 
they would have, if you like, rich privileges, and they could actually, you know, um, prove provenance, they could transact, but they would not necessarily, um, you know, have the same, you know, uh, uh, right privileges as the central bank. But this is still a decentralized system, right? The whole thing works on decentralized consensus. It, it has to be the case that the commercial banks all agree uh, on what the current state of the world is. Um, uh, so, you know, there may be, so, you know, this is the thing that I actually just glossed over, which is the notion of a, of a notary. In the case of permission blockchains like, um, uh, like Corda, so this is a permission the DLT system um, uh, that is provided by this uh, firm called R3. Uh, it, it, it relies on these zero knowledge proofs to prove provenance, but then it has a, no, um, a role for a notary. And you need a notary as well in this case, because you know, uh, it's not enough to just prove provenance. You need to also ensure that that token is not uh, double spent, yeah? So that's really more about what happens between now and, and the next period rather than what happened in the past. So what happened in the past, you can use uh, with, uh, you know, you can actually ensure with zero knowledge proofs. For the next step, you need a notary. You don't uh, have to use that. I mean, there are alternative uh, permission uh, DLT systems as well. I've just shown you an example of Corda, which is, uh, you know, which has been around, um, uh, you know, uh, for some time. It's some of the many of the BIS innovation have experiments run on this uh, on this DLT system. So that's an, you know, that's by way of illustration. And there is a, you know, there is this, um, uh, you know, this um, this add-on to the Ethereum blockchain called Hyperledger. Bezu, which actually has these two groups of uh, of nodes, you know that there is a um, there is a group of uh, you know uh, um, if you like the the central bank like nodes who actually have the permission to read and to write, and then there are the ordinary nodes. Mm -hmm. uh, the short answer is um, you need to settle this before you get to the. Uh, uh, so this is not an open permissionless blockchain because um, mm -hmm. if you had that, then of course you know. You know, there's a reason why Bitcoin emerged in the way that it did. It's trying to navigate these constraints um, from having to make the whole system you know, open and permissionless. Uh, for CBDCs, um, with real names, with central banks playing this uh, role, you're entering already uh, with a larger possibility set because you don't have that constraint. Yeah? You're actually removing that, uh, uh, you know, that constraint. Can I just move to some of the... Um, some of the sort of technical features, uh, because I think this is probably where the most interest would be. Programmability, yeah, um, or the ability to make payments conditional on certain conditions being met, uh, self-executing smart contracts, and, uh, uh, you know, um, settling transactions as a bundle, you know, so-called atomic settlement. Uh, and atomic is referring to the fact that uh, uh, a set of transactions are inseparable they should either all be transacted or none of them are, right? So it's a, case, it's a way of um, building in contingencies. Uh, you can do all of that using, using CBDC. Same with composability, combine different functions, you know, so-called money Legos. You can have very, very complicated transactions uh, that you see, for example, in the DeFi applications uh, of crypto. All of that is possible uh, using CBDCs, using real names. And the most interesting thing is tokenization. This is where you actually um, have a real world asset and you wrap it in the legal wrapper and then tokenize it on the DLT platform itself. You can, for example, tokenize a house, right? You can actually tokenize a house and you can actually buy fractional um, you know, shares of a house. Why is this such a good example of what you can uh, achieve? Well, you know, buying a house is probably uh, the biggest expenditure uh, that any ordinary person would be making uh, in his or her lifetime. These are big payments. And here there's a very, very sort of delicate set of things that have to be, you know, in place. So, you know, the buyer of the house uh, would like to, you know, make the payment, but only on the condition that the title is transferred. The seller wants to ensure that the title is transferred only on the condition that the money is received. But then there's all this other stuff, right? Um, are there any un, uh, you know, unpaid taxes on the house? Are there any uh, unknown liens on the house? You know, there's all the stuff to do with um, you know, the, uh, the due diligence. Now, all of that you can do 
with one smart contract using a CBDC. And you can also tokenize deposits. So, you know, if, if you read the chapter, we talk about how you can have tokenized deposits uh, so that, uh, you know, JP Morgan coin like tokens are also circulating within the same platform as CBDCs. Hold on, but you would say the house token would yeah. be a CBDC or it would no, just be on the ledger of the central the bank? So the, so, so, the, so the house token would be a token that is transacting uh, on the DLT platform. Um, and there's a legal wrapper. So there is a registry, okay, mm -hmm. which is outside the DLT. So you need a trusted registry. Yeah, we can't just decentralize that. That says if this particular token refers to a particular house, yeah, and there's the address. And you can have that fractionalized uh, and trade that just as you would uh, trading stocks and shares. We already know that uh, you can securitize or you can tokenize financial assets. For example, in the experiment uh, in the uh, innovation hub, in the BIS innovation hub, Uh, project called Jura that we had uh, between the BIS, the Swiss National Bank, and the Bank of France. We actually had a, um, a quarter platform where we had commercial paper tokenized. And it was very, very clear that this system worked. You can actually, you, you can actually tokenize financial assets. In the same way, you can tokenize houses. Now, why is this such an important uh, application? Well, imagine trying to do that using crypto. Imagine trying to tokenize a house using crypto. What you would need to do is to tokenize a house, you know, which is in your real name, but using a private key. There would have to be an, an additional layer that says, well, this private key has to be, uh, you know, is, is a, it, it you know, belongs to this person who is this, you know, this uh, rightful owner, uh, you know, by virtue of the transaction of this house. And, um, If you think about real world assets, there has to be some way of connecting real world assets to the blockchain itself. And this has been the big challenge with DeFi, right? This is why, you know, if you look at DeFi, most of the assets that are traded in DeFi are other crypto coins. There are very, very few real world assets. And that's all, or it's, you know, NFTs, it's, uh, it's pictures of bored apes. It has to be something that, has to, that, that actually has form um, as a digital entity, as a, as a digital object. It's very, very difficult to actually tokenize a real world asset. With a CBDC system, it actually opens up this enormous possibility of using all the technical capabilities of composability, smart contracts, atomic settlement, but also using real world assets. And this I think is the, Is the important point that I think um, uh, that really sort of emerges when you look at this. Um, I don't know how much time I have, uh, Marcus. I see that- uh, We can uh, take a little bit more, but I just okay. want to come back to my supply chain example in the automotive sure. industry. In instead of a house, I can also take an engine, no? Absolutely. I, I take an uh, engine, but yeah. it's done by this supply chain uh, platform who is doing this. It has, is not connected to the central bank necessarily. You're absolutely right. So connect, uh, connect client, to everything in the central bank. It will be this mega power institution will manage all this, all the different activities across various platforms and the whole economy. Or no, no, no. no most of the customer-facing activities are done by the private sector institutions. Yeah, mm -hmm. but coming back to a supply chain example, there's nothing in the supply chain example that says it has to be used in conjunction with the CBDC, right? If you think about the blockchain, it is just a database and it's a distributed database. You know, everyone has, a, has the identical copy of the database uh, of, you know, where a particular item of inventory is in the particular supply chain. It's just that if everyone has the same copy of that database, it's just much better that everyone is on the same page. You know, we have common knowledge, yeah, which is key for any kind of coordination. So... There's nothing in the supply chain DLT applications that says that it has to be used with a particular you know, form of a digital currency. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that, you know, but, but of course, you know, we could link it, yeah, which would actually take it one, le you know, one level further. Yeah. Um, but it's important to separate, if you like, the database uh, nature of the blockchain from 
uh, the use, you know, just tying everything uh, with a CBDC. Uh, you could do it, but you, but, but, uh, you know, you don't have to, right? But what I wanted to do, Marcus, is just to take this to the international context. And I, I, I wish I had time to talk about PICS, um, which is just, well, maybe, maybe just, a, just a couple of uh, seconds on PICS. PICS mm-hmm. is the, the new payment system in Brazil. It is very close to a retail CBDC in many ways, but it's not quite a CBDC. I say it's very close to a CBDC because it shares the same data architecture. You know, there's a, it's an open architecture um, and APIs, these application programming interfaces, ensures that any bank or payment service provider has to play by the rules, which actually allows interoperability between the payment service providers. It was rolled out in November, 2020. And within a year, it actually signed up two thirds of the adult population in Brazil. And you see this green line, you know, that's been the trajectory of the transactions and picks. It actually has overtaken debit and credit cards. Um, and of course, it's a much cheaper system. For individuals, it's free. For merchants, the latest the estimate is that they pay 22 basis points. If you compare, uh, if you compare that to merchant fees, for credit and debit cards, you know, it's like one tenth of the merchant fees. The other interesting thing, and I think this is relevant for the debate on CBDCs uh, um, in the US, in the Euro area and in many uh, jurisdictions where the concern is about, um, you know, the encroachment on the the businesses of commercial banks. You know, there was a lot of um, uh, debate early on with PICS about whether it would actually crowd out the commercial banks and their businesses. In fact, what actually happened was that uh, as the PIX uh, system rolled out, uh, the use of credit and debit cards actually went up rather than than down. More people were actually opening bank accounts. And the latest, and this was something that was discussed um, at the annual general meeting here at the BIS uh, over the last weekend. At the latest estimate, it seems that what this has done is to create new business opportunities for the commercial banks. So far from easing out the commercial banks or you know, easing out uh, and you know, uh, you know, having their lunch and so on, in fact, it seems that they've actually done a big favor to the, to the commercial banks. Um, Can I just ask some clarification? Uh, sure. Is it the case that the number of total transactions went up in total dramatically in order to make yeah. this possible? And is it the case that the small transactions are done on PICs yeah. and only the big ones on credit cards? So, you know, the, the, so the story that you see here, and this is a really uh, you know, inspiring, uh, you know, this is really an inspiring story, actually, for financial inclusion. Um, credit and debit cards, you know, they're very, uh, you know, for, for, for uh, ordinary individuals, those were, you know, for small transactions, certainly, uh, they were really out of, uh, you know, out of their reach. For you know services like music streaming, for the Internet of Things, you know these micropayments again, credit and debit cards. You know the fees are you know much larger compared to the underlying value. With PIX, something like this, and a retail CBDC would be very similar. The fees are actually close to zero, and so you can act, then integrate all these other digital services on top. I think this is what. Um, you know, this is the picture that I was trying to convey here that, you know, you can see these, um, oops, I'm going all the way back um, to this chart here. You can think of a whole sort of ecosystem of stuff that you can build on top. Um, and this is a sense in which, you know, it's not a zero sum game. You know, once you actually have financial inclusion, you can actually open up a whole new set of, uh, you know, set of business uh, opportunities, uh, you know, for the private sector. It's not that the central bank wants to do all of this. Clearly, you know, central banks don't want to do this. But um, the private sector, and here it's not just the commercial banks, it's the, you know, it's the other service providers. So Marcus, I, I know we're, you know, we're overrunning. Let me just conclude with one other point, which is about uh, um, the cross-border dimension. And, uh, you know, I promised to come back to your question about the dollar. Um, you know, we, we are thinking of this as trees. So each country's monetary system is a tree. The solid trunk is the central bank. The big branches are the commercial banks and the PSPs, and then the you know, services are on top. Think of the forest. Now zoom out and think of the forest of the trees. 
That's the global monetary system. And think of the canopy, yeah? Think of the canopy where the branches come together. And the canopy is our metaphor for the multi-CBDC platforms. This is where the CBDC platforms, you know, this is where the CBDCs of many central banks can come together. So, if you th so this is a view from the top, right? So this is the view from the top of the canopy. Um, the central banks are in brown, the commercial banks and other PSPs are in blue. We need um, a decentralized system here because that, you know, it's for good governance reasons. Uh, there's no one central bank that is in charge of all these different currencies. There are more than one, there's more than one central bank. There's more than one currency involved. And it's very natural that these kinds of systems are governed uh, as uh, you know, DLT based systems. And, that's it. and, and the, the, the Jura uh, project that I mentioned earlier is an example of this, where it was the Swiss National Bank and the Banque de France. The BIS uh, was in the middle facilitating this, but you had both central banks. There was a notary for the Swiss franc leg and a notary for the euro leg. And there was a tokenized commercial paper that was trading on the platform. We have uh, several other of these experiments going on. There's one in Hong Kong called Project Enbridge. Uh, and there's one uh, coming out of, uh, of Singapore that's called Project Dunbar. We actually issued a report on this. If you're, you know, if any of the uh, viewers are interested, we actually had a comparative analysis of these uh, multi CBDC platforms. There are some choices you have to make when you, you know, when you, uh, you know, embark on this, and it's not obvious that you know there is a, you know, there is a correct way of doing it. But the point is that uh, once you have this kind of, you know, um, multi CBDC platform, you can have many different currencies, uh, you know, all being traded. Now, what about the dollar? Now, the dollar clearly is a key international currency. Uh, as we know, dollar is the invoicing currency for international trade. Does it mean that we, we need the Fed uh, to issue a, a, a Fed CBDC? Well, the answer to that is that, uh, you know, uh, it's not necessarily, yeah? What you can think about is, if you think about our uh, in a description of this, of this ecosystem, and we have tokenized deposits of commercial banks. Think about JP Morgan coin, for example. If you have tokenized you know, liabilities of e-money providers, you can have uh, the dollar denominated coins uh, being traded um, very much in analogy with the current system where the settlement still happens Via, you know, via the, uh, the Fed's balance sheet um, in the regular RTGS system. And, you know, uh, as you know, Marcus, the Fed is currently conducting a, a consultation on this. There's a consultation paper. Um, I hope, uh, you know, many of the, of the viewers, you know, uh, um, sent in their uh, responses. Um, but clearly, you know, this element on the, on the currency dimension, this is, this is going to be a very important, uh, you know, dimension of the discussion, uh, you know, and there was a recent uh, conference um, at the Fed, actually, on the role of the dollar. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this, this issue actually came up on that, on that but panel. It well. doesn't need to be a CBDC. It could be done by a stable coin, I guess. JP Morgan. It could be a CBDC. Coin, and CBDC. That just... uh, could be a tokenized deposit. Mm -hmm. It could even be a stable coin provided that the stable coin has, uh, you know, it ticks all the right boxes. If it's a narrow bank, if it's a stable coin that is 100% uh, backed, you know, by uh, central bank reserves, you know, that would be a narrow bank. Uh, now that could be a stable coin. Uh, I mean, if, so, um, so I think we're now getting into some very interesting territory about uh, the exact, uh, you know, design of these things. But in the broad sweep of things, Uh, the important point, Marcus, is that we don't need a Fed CBDC. Uh, well, we don't necessarily need a Fed CBDC. If the Fed decides, or if the, I mean, the consultation is really more than the Fed, it's really the, um, uh, it's really the, uh, the uh, you know, the U.S. electorate. You know, if they and uh, and uh, the elected representatives, if they decide that CBDCs are not uh, the way to go. Uh, you know, then that's clearly a choice that needs to be respected. But there are other ways of integrating, uh, you know, dollar digital assets, uh, you know, into these platforms. 
But so let me minimum uh, requirement uh, would, would yeah. be to have uh, a solid regulation of stable coins and backing of stable coins. Well, um, if it's a narrow bank, uh, of course, you know that would be in a way um, a way to really apply the same set of regulations that we have now on the on the banking regulation. As you know, uh, and maybe we can have a quick discussion about this. Um, there's of course a very active discussion going on right now about uh, additional regulation of crypto. The focus is very much on financial stability and uh, investor protection. But uh, you know these deeper structural issues are definitely there that we need to address. And, um, and I think this is where I, you know I think the BIS can really play a very big role. And uh, you know this is not just to blow our own trumpet. You know we are, after all the bank for international settlements and uh, the international you know and international settlements uh, is really you know uh, our dna and so um, you know this is what we are you know focused on right now um, and uh, you know i think this this type of interaction with you and the audience i think is going to be uh, you know all very helpful so I have so, perhaps i can raise a few more questions from the audience sure. because i Put them aside. So, one question was: If you you emphasized very much the role of CBDC, and if you give so much room for CBDCs, does it also give room for speculation with CBDCs, as crypto does? And then Francesco from from Sony asked: You know, when you talked about your housing example, that yeah. you give more trading opportunities, you can trade part of a house and all this. But it also it might not be welfare improving necessarily. People speculate that you know that do other things with that. Uh, is it necessarily welfare improving that we can just trade many more things and financialize essentially everything, um, or should we just plow ahead and um, allow it? So let me answer those two questions. Uh... And, and then I throw the final question to it. Okay. There's of course a, a vision you outlined for the BIS. Yeah, it's the vision for the, the IMF is also proposing something. Can you highlight what differences are between both visions? Well, let me start with that last question because uh, that's an easy one. Um, um, the BIS and the IMF are working very, very closely uh, on a number of different fronts. So, you know, we, uh, in fact, for the G20 meeting that's coming up soon, um, the BIS Innovation Hub. Uh, wrote a joint report with the IMF and the World Bank um, on the the roadmap for cross border payments, and you know we are very much on the same page on the public policy angle. You know the IMF has a different history. Uh, you know it was set up very much in the in the Bretton Woods uh, spirit. Um, the sense of the monetary system, you know uh, the international monetary system, which is very much um, uh, you know the heart of the IMF's mandate. Now that's very much in the spirit of um, the interactions between official sector participants, you know, governments. Mm -hmm. maybe. Um, it's less so with the commercial banks, the private sector, certainly less so with central banks. Um, so in that respect, you know, they're very much more to do with governments, uh, the current account, trade, uh, and so on. Um, I guess the BIS, you know, we're a bank. Um, so, uh, and, you know, we interact very much also with the private sector. Uh, so I think that is the difference. But of course, we're very complementary with the IMF. Um, so uh, we're working very closely. I mean, that's a short answer. On the speculation, would CBDCs, um, uh, you know, spark speculation in CBDCs? Well, CBDCs can operate without having to sell coins, yeah? The whole point of crypto is that you have to buy these coins in order to get your ticket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is where all the problems arise. Why do you need to buy coins when, you know, it's a basic public good? It's a, you know, it's a public good. If you don't have to buy coins, it's like saying, well, will um, the fact that uh, you're holding cash mean that cash is the subject of speculation? Well, I, probably not. Yeah. So but I think I have that to buy a CBDC too. Now I have to go to my bank and give some bank deposits to somebody who is selling me them CBDC claim. Well, it's, it's one just for a one. It's like a stable coin. It's just a fixed price. In a sense. Yeah. It's you know it's one for one. 
I mean, you would, you would, uh, you know, you would not have to go to your branch. Uh, you know, you could do it on your phone. Um, and it's going to be extremely, extremely sort of smooth. And, you know, we know from these experiments uh, in those jurisdictions where they're already, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're already close to rolling out these uh, retail CBDCs, that it looks in the fields like a, you know, like one of your sort of phone apps. The other issue, uh, remind me what the second question was, Marcus. The second question was about if you tokenize a house and you can buy uh, yeah. a fraction of a house, then you open yeah. up more speculation. And it's, we have a lot of models where we're saying if you can trade more, it's actually welfare is going down. Yeah. So it's yeah, not yeah. clear by making everything tradable fractionally and all this, it's welfare improving. How would we judge which yeah. tradability we allow and which ones we don't? Well, I guess here, um, and I think this is uh, probably this is you know probably something that you would say, Marcus. Everything depends on how much credit you receive. So if the housing boom is part of a credit boom, we know that uh, you know that's just asking for trouble. Um, and in fact, as we look out there right now, it's those jurisdictions that uh, actually you know pretty much uh, went through the GFC unscathed. Those are the jurisdictions that have the highest uh, household debt levels. Uh, that's where the housing prices are, you know, at the historical highs. Mm -hmm. And this is why, you know, uh, many in the official community were actually concerned that, you know, as we tighten monetary policy, uh, you know, this is actually one of the um, one of the vulnerabilities we have to, you know, keep an eye on. So I think um, the issue of uh, speculation, again, I think that's very much tied to the, <clears throat> to if you like, what kind of credit environment, uh, you know, you're in. What I was, you know, referring to was much more on the operational risk side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, if you, uh, you know, many of your, your viewers will have bought and sold houses, just imagine how difficult that was, you know, you have to pay, uh, you know, whatever percent um, to your agent. That's, you know, that's the first thing. You have to, you know, search for the registries. You have to get, uh, you know, make sure that the title is clean. Uh, and what about that transaction? You know, you have to go through the lawyer. So all of that, you know, this is the kind of thing that crypto does extremely well. You know, DeFi, you know, you would do it in a second because it's, uh, you know, the money leg. And the point is we can do all of that using CBDCs and a tokenized deposit. So it's really to, um, help the um to remove some of the frictions in the real world transaction it's essentially I, a land registry i put it on the blockchain or that makes it easy i don't have a title insurance and all these things anymore absolutely. but then the cbdc connection is the payment of the house. absolutely yeah and we have that in the securities uh settlement yeah it's called payment versus delivery mm -hmm. so with securities you know, we want uh, that instant settlement and we can do that using DLT. So that's now old hat. That kind of experiment we've done already a few years back in the project called Helvetia here in Switzerland, we know that that works. And the same principle can be applied once you tokenize the land registry, once you tokenize the, the property registry. And, um, and remember, you know, this can only be done if you have real names. If you have crypto, that's going to be very, very difficult. So this is a sense in which CBDCs, you know, open up a whole new vista of possibilities. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Hyun. Uh, it was good to get uh, your perspective and also, I guess, you'll shine through the perspective of the BIS, uh, how you envision the future that will look like. And uh, we're sure you will make the, the best out of it. And uh, we will have a new financial system and connecting everything. <laughs> Uh, house purchases and many many things down the road and uh, thanks again and uh, hope to see you soon in the real world very soon again thanks and, Marcus. Uh, we and stay thanks. in touch and thanks to everyone who joined yeah thanks to all of you for participating and hope to see you soon again for another webinar bye-bye cheers